All righty. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jessica LeClaire. I'm a program director with Sustainable CT. And today we're joined by Anna Tang of the League of American Bicyclists, who's going to talk to us about becoming a bicycle friendly community, which is really exciting. Um, the bicycle friendly community program is in alignment with one of our actions, action 6.1.5. So if you attain at least the bronze status as a bicycle friendly community, you get 10 points in our program, which is really cool. And you have a bicycle friendly community, which is also really cool. And I just wanted to, to point out that this action is also part of our climate leader designation. And the climate leader designation is something new. So I'll, I'll talk about it for a minute here. Essentially, in our big list of sustainable CT actions, we've pulled out a specific smaller list of actions that will help communities reduce greenhouse gas emissions and or improve your resilience. Um, so this is on that list. Um, so if you if you are to work through and um, become a bicycle friendly community, you get 10 points uh, for the climate leader designation as well. The designation is on top of your bronze or silver certification as a town, and it's required for our new gold certification. And if anyone has questions on that, we'd be happy to discuss them further. But with no further ado, I really want to turn it over to Anna, who's going to guide us in today's discussion. Great. Um, I will start sharing my screen. Um, this always takes me a second, even though I've done it for the last three years. So let's see if this is working. Share. And I will go into presentation mode, slideshow. Okay, can you see it, everybody? Is it the full screen or is it just a small screen? We can see it and it is, uh, now it's jumping into presentation mode. Cool, awesome. So welcome, thank you for joining. It's nice to see all of you. My name is Anna Tang. I am the Bicycle Friendly America Program Specialist here at the League of American Bicyclists. Have any of you heard of the league or of our bicycle friendly community program? Maybe like raise your hand or say yes in the comments, but if not, that's totally fine. That's why you're here. So I can see, I can help you to learn more about the program. So without further ado, the League of American Bicyclists. So we are one of the oldest national advocacy group for people who bike. And we were started in 1880 um, as the League of American Wheelmen, where we advocated for roads that were getting ruts in them from wagon wheels. And, you know, we've been in continuous operation since then. And now we are a team of about 13 people and we are based in DC. I work remotely out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and then about the other half of our staff work remotely across the US and the other half are in the DC area. Um, but we help to advocate for biking all over the country on a lot of different levels. And we also host a national bike summit. So our main focus areas are education. We have our smart cycling program where you can become a lead certified instructor, which gives you all the qualifications and instruction for how to teach people how to ride bikes. Uh, we also do policy and advocacy at the federal, state, and local level, um, where we also do national campaigns and helping to work on policy and those kind of topics. Um, we also host the National Bike Summit, which is coming up March 26th through 29th in D.C., which if you aren't registered to attend, you can attend in person, which is awesome because you meet tons of other people just like yourselves. Um, and it's a lot, it's like very high energy. There's really cool um, sessions, but you can also attend it virtually. So there's two options there. And then what I'm here to talk about today is our Bicycle Friendly America programming, which um, is made up of the state community businesses and universities programs. So our Bicycle Friendly America program, like I said, has our Bicycle Friendly State community businesses and universities, and they're located in all 50 states all across the country. So wherever you are, you'll find one. Um, the There's different application cycles for each of our programs. Um, our Bicycle Friendly State program, you cannot opt out of it. We just do it um, 
every few years and we critique each state on different uh, criteria. Our Bicycle Friendly Community Program, which you're all here to learn about today, has two application cycles a year. One like right around now, we just closed one and then one around like in the August timeframe. Um, and we have currently 501 uh, Bicycle Friendly Communities. We also have the Bicycle Friendly Business uh, Program, which is part of building a bicycle friendly community, which has three application cycles a year, and then our Bicycle Friendly University program, which has one application cycle a year, which um, works out pretty well with how most universities function. It is due in the summertime. Um, there are some fees for some of our programs. The community program is free to apply, so there's really no reason to not apply for this uh, like program because it is free. Our university is $100 per application. And then the business program has different fees associated on number of employees or type of business. Um, and you can find all of that information on our website, which is bikeleague.org slash BFA. Um, and I wanted to pause and hear from you all about like, what do you envision your ideal community looking like? So uh, if you just want to unmute yourselves um, and kind of announce maybe like what you envision an ideal community looking like to you. So I know it's, I know it can be, sh you can be shy, but like. Okay. Do you no want me to start answer. off? This sure. Steve Mitchell. Hey, how are you? So uh, from Bicycle Friendly, Simsbury, Connecticut, the first town in southern New England to get the BFC. Uh, we beat Boston. Um, so, but I'm also on the board of uh, Bike Walk Connecticut, and I was a I'm former board member of the East Coast Greenway. Uh, say hello to Bill Nesper for me next time you talk to him. Um, but yeah, our vision is, you know, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Connecticut set a record last year. We had 37 bike and pedestrian debt. Uh, it was 78, excuse me, 78 bicycle and pedestrian deaths here in Connecticut. So that's not a good record. Um, we're, we're hoping for a better year this year. Um, most of those deaths were, were pedestrian, but, um, so anyway, so I, I'm hoping that Connecticut wakes up. We're 20th bicycle friendly state in the country. We're sitting next to Massachusetts, which as you know, is the number one state in the country for bicycle friendliness. Um, and we, we set up a, a goal last night at our Bike Walk Connecticut meeting that we wanna be in the top 10. So we need people on this call, on this Zoom meeting, and we need other communities in Connecticut I believe we have, is the number 10 or 11 bike friendly communities? Do you know? For, for what? Bicycle friendly communities. I think Connecticut has either 10 or 11. Are you, do you know? Oh, oh number of communities. Yeah, 10. 10. Okay. So there are two silver. One is Simsbury. The other one's New Haven. Um, but there's, a, we've, we've got, there, there's room for, there's lots of room for improvement. And if anybody on the Zoom after the Zoom meeting wants to contact me, they, you know, feel free. I'm easy to find. Um, and, you know, we just got to get, we all got to work together, uh, especially those towns where the East Coast Greenway goes through, and, or if you have any greenways in your town. So, so we need to, as I said to a Department of Transportation engineer friend of mine the other day, the 40s, 50s, and 60s were not good years for bicyclists or pedestrians in this country. Roads were designed for cars and trucks to go faster and more volume and with no regard for bicyclists or cars and for, for bicyclists or pedestrians. And so we need Connecticut to come around and our former commissioner, Redeker, uh, DOT commissioner, he did a lot to expand the East Coast Greenway. We need to keep on it and we're working on some legislative sessions, HB 5917 and, and stuff that's gonna help uh, create new laws and, and safety. And hopefully we get more and more divided roads, uh, protected roads, such as greenways, such as you know physical protection for bicyclists. Um, and that's it. So that's all I got. <laughs> 
but yeah. what does anybody else see? <laughs> yeah, so you're looking for like connected networks, building connected out towns, all the structures. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, and like community support for this stuff. Right. Well, one of the problems that I, and I've gone to probably 20, 30, or 30 at least, bicycle friendly mm -hmm. meetings around the state of Connecticut. And, and when people say to me, well, I got to put my bike on the car and drive to a greenway. And it's like, you shouldn't have to do that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. Um, does anybody else want to chime in? Go ahead. Something that you might, what you, your ideal community might look like. Maybe I'll let like one or two more people say something. Hi, I'll say something. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, my um, ideal community is one where biking and walking are considered to be ide the, the best forms of transportation and where they are acknowledged by car drivers to be have um, equal rights and should have equal space. Because my main observation, hi, I'm Chris Feely, sorry. I live in West Hartford. Mm -hmm. um, my main observation in West Hartford is that the vast majority of people who drive in West Hartford, which actually there's a lot of pass through, um, a lot of pass through traffic in West Hartford, which I think some of those people have no regard for West Hartford at all. They're going down Main Street toward mm -hmm. from Bloomfield to, I don't know where, Newington or somewhere, um, is that they see pedestrians and bicycle riders as just a nuisance. And like, why are they there? You know, why are people riding bikes on the street? Why are people walking? So I would, that's, that would be my um, ideal community. Okay. Um, maybe one more person, do you wanna share? No? Okay. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. So I actually just, I'm from the town of Thomaston. I just joined the Naugatuck Greenway Committee, which um, we just started again in November of last year. So this is all very new to me. Uh, so I just kind of like listening to hear what everyone has to say about it. I'm hoping that I guess the, the biking will be a whole aspect of the Greenway. I guess that's the same thing, right? It's not just walking, but so I don't know, I, I, I like listening to your guys' opinions and things like that. So I'm more here just to listen, but um, I, I hope that Thomaston will um, adopt this, I guess. This um, this is my first time hearing about it too. So no, I appreciate, so I'm just gonna listen in and thank you. Nice, yeah. There is no wrong answer to this question. So it's really just to help people like think about an ideal community that you would like to live in or you would wanna visit even, you know, like thinking about that. Um, but just to get us to move on with the presentation. So like, you know, when you're thinking about a community where you want to live, where you want to work, um, you know, like the top two pictures, it's like, do you want to live somewhere like those types of places? Or do you want to live more like in a community that looks more like the bottom two places? The one on the left is clearly in France and the one on the bottom right I'm 99% sure that's in Boston. I forget right this second, but I believe that is a re road reconfigure there. So that is something that's attainable and has been done already in the United States. Um, so why become a bicycle friendly community? So um, there's a lot of reasons to do it, but you know, at the very base level, it's to help your community become more bicycle friendly for people who are able and want to bike or need to bike. Um, but in addition to that, you get feedback and recognition through the application process. Um, it helps your community to achieve its goals, whether they are climate action, maybe a mobility plan, complete your bike plan. You know, like you in Connecticut, you have this sustainable Connecticut program. So it helps you get that score on that um, or even regional plans. Um, it helps to create safer streets. It gives you a healthier community by giving people access to safe places to ride. Um, and, you know, every day more and more people across the country and hopefully in your community are choosing to commute by bike uh, for whatever reason. And communities that do become bicycle friendly because they are actively working on bicycle friendly initiatives tend to rank higher in places where people want to move to. And it creates jobs and uh, places that people want to have their businesses. Um, 
So our com bicycle friendly community program started in 2003. So it's not super old, but it's not brand new. Uh, we currently have 501 bicycle friendly communities in all 50 states. The application process is now completely online and we don't accept any paper applications. It all has to be filled out online. We use our 5E framework as a roadmap to help guide communities, which you can see here is education, equity and accessibility, engineering, encouragement, evaluation, and planning. Um, we review each community individually and look at the materials that you submit on the application and then give you feedback on it. And then we have four award levels and six categories. So that goes from no award all the way up to platinum. Um, the feedback portion of the application process is uh, very robust. We send out a community survey to your community, which you distribute, but we create the survey and we try to get you to give it to as many people as possible. So uh, people who bike and people who don't bike alike, alike to give the feedback. Um, and then we also give you a report card, which is like this right picture, the picture on the right hand side of the page, which which includes a score for each of your E's as well as like very um, robust feedback for each section so that it's transparent and you actually get concrete ways to move up in the scores that you get. Um, so the bicycle friendly community, like I said, is all across the country. And uh, right now we have 347 communities that are bronze. It is what most communities get. Most communities either rank bronze or honorable mention on their first try. Um, we have 109 silver, 35 gold, and five in the platinum level. I thought because it's Connecticut, you'd want to see how your uh, state rates. Um, you are 20th, uh, just like Steve, Steve said. Um, you have 10 communities, 18 businesses, and two bicycle friendly universities. You can, I know this might be like small and hard for you to read. So if you go to our website, bikeleague.org slash BFA slash awards, you can look up your state and actually read these. Click, you can view their report cards, um, and you can see like the actual list across the state. Um, and then here's a list of all of your bicycle friendly businesses too. So even though like I'm here to talk about the community application, the reason I included the businesses and the universities is because together they all, you know, help to create a more bicycle friendly community. And oftentimes having businesses who can buy into the concept of bicycle friendliness can also help to convince local leaders to put in this infrastructure, add bike racks, you know, doing uh, low hanging fruit like that, which um, having the support of businesses is really important. Um, you can also look on our Connect Locally map to find all of the league supported um, bicycle friendly content like league cycling instructors and similar similar people or similar organizations in your area. And if you want to get on the map, this is, you can become a bicycle friendly business or community or university, and then you will show up on this connect locally map. Um, so about the community and getting started with the application process. So like I said, it is free to apply and it's all online. And to begin the application, I think that it is, my advice is to get everybody who needs to be involved in the application process to get together so that you can review the application as a team and people know like what kind of information they'll need to gather. So that's like your school district, your city employees or your municipal employees, um, anybody you know, advocates, uh, disability advocates, ADA compliance folks, you know, anybody who has a hand in creating any aspect of becoming bicycle friendliness together and go over the application. Um, we have a Word doc uh, version of it, which you can download and distribute. Um, I suggest like creating a Google doc version of it so you can collaborate on it online with all the people and then having one person actually submit the application, but having all of the answers collected on a Google Doc because it is a very robust application process. If you're filling it out for your first time, I would say it might take you any, depending on how much information you already have at hand, it could take um, anywhere between like 
10 to 20 hours. It might take longer if you don't have any of the information um, together and you need to collect it. But if you have all the information, it might even take you like two hours. And as you renew applications, which happens every four years, um, your previous information carries over. And then all you have to do is update if you have any new information to submit. So the initial time you apply is the longest, most um, involved process. And then after that, it should be pretty simple. Um, so once it's in, you need to create an account to start. You need a lead applicant, like I said, to uh, submit the application, but multiple people can have access to it. And then the two deadlines are in the spring and in the fall. Um, so like if you see on this slide, there's that manage collaborators button, which like once you get into our portal, uh, that is how you can assign more than one person to work on the application online. I do think it's easier to do it in a Google Doc or a shared doc because that way, um, if two people are signed in, like you need to collaborate because only one person can edit the application at a time, even though you can have multiple people working on it. So you don't want to lose any of the work that you're doing. Um, and then on the right is just a list of the types of people or types of groups that you'll probably want to reach out to in order to gather information about your community and what's going on around biking. Um, so I already said before, like it, we judge communities and we use our 5E criteria to look at a community's bicycle friendliness, as well as any supplementary, supplementary material you want to include. Um, we take the community's community context into consideration. For example, you know, like we're not going to judge New York <coughs> the same way that we're going to judge a community of like 500 people, you know? So we really take the community context into account and your street network and everything. So we we judge your community on your community. We don't judge it against other communities. Um, so with that, we do take each community into account. Um, and then for each of the E's, so on equity and accessibility, this is what we look at when we're looking at what your community is doing around the equity and accessibility. So data, any barriers to bicycling and um, what the city is doing around, or like your community or municipality um, around equity and accessibility, like data, reports, engagement, um, when it comes to bicycle education, we divide it into three different categories. So youth, adult, and driver education. So what are you doing for your school students? Um, adult education is like, what on bike education are you offering? Do you have any LCIs in your area who can teach? Driver education is how are you teaching drivers to interact with people on bikes and drive and how to like look out for uh, people on bikes and interact. In our encouragement section, we talk about policies, partnerships, and programs, and wayfinding, culture, events, and anything that you're doing within your community to encourage people to get out and ride. Um, so there's a lot of different things that communities do around this topic. Um, in our evaluation and planning section, this is a little bit more um, like municipal focus, city focus. So it's like, who, who do you have on your city staff? Do you have any committees like a BPAC, so a bicycle and pedestrian advisory committee or something similar? Do you have um, plans or policies that focus on biking, like a bike master plan, a transportation, active transportation plan? And how are you doing your engagement? Are you doing enough or intentional things to engage a broad audience with this? And what data technology are you using and any regional coordination? Um, in our engineering section, we talk again about policies like complete street policies, your bicycle network, how connected it is, end of trip facilities, so like bike parking, your maintenance, how you go over maintenance, um, access to public transportation, bike shares, transportation demand management, and technology. Um, and then also like within our application for a lot of these sections, we have links that take you to resources outside of the application. So if you need help or you want to feel educated, we try to have the most up-to-date information within our application to help guide communities along the way and help to educate them. Um, 
on the bottom left, that graph is new for this application cycle, and we're going to continue to use it, which quantifies your bicycle lane mileage and your connectivity. So we're looking at that. Um, we also have a resource section on our website for communities to look at and check out to find resources. Um, and then, like I said, like within the application itself. So there's also um, funding is, you know, a huge part of becoming a bicycle friendly community. If you don't have money, you can't really build things and connect your network. So we have a whole page on federal funding resources and um, you can always reach out to me and I can connect you possibly with our staff or someone who might be able to help you along the lines of funding and finding federal funding. But we also have like a very um, in-depth page about federal funding resources. Um, and then finally, the BFC submission deadline. So I wanted to say, like, if you want to work on an application and try to get it in before the August 30th deadline, there's plenty of time to do that. You have like six months. So you should be able to get it in by then. Um, I'm always available or somebody on our BFA team is always available to help with the application process. And if you want reminders or if you want to just get involved with the broader community of bicycle friendly uh, communities, you can sign up for our newsletter. Um, and then I just wanted to say, you know, like join us, join us for like all the things that we do because we, there is like a wonderful network of people all across the country, just like all of you here, you know, in every state, there's a lot of different communities that are similar to yours that you might be able to learn from and find examples or share. We just started doing quarterly uh, networking calls for bicycle friendly community applicants where you can meet with other people you know, share, share different topics, hear from people. And so if you join us, you know, we would love for you to come along with this journey. Um, and then finally, here's my contact information and I will stop presenting and turn it over to questions. Let's see, stop sharing. So does anybody have questions? I have a question, if mm -hmm. that's okay. Yeah. Um, what are some common things that um, bicycle-friendly communities do on their application? What are some of the biggest common threads? Um, so I think something that I didn't mention, but that is really common, is you don't have to score ha check every single box on the application in order to get a designation. And so something a lot of communities do is they focus on two or three of the five E's before expanding to all, to being like really great at all five. So um, most times if someone gets, a community gets a bronze level, um, they have like two or three really strong E's, like they pick engineering or encouragement or education and, you know, like whatever makes the most sense. And then um, they focus on those instead of trying to go for like every single checkbox in the entire application. So can I make a comment? So not a question, but a comment. But so just because I've been involved with probably about five or six different communities that went for bike friendly community mm -hmm. um, and I've been through the application process many times. One thing I would recommend to people that are on this Zoom call is that don't bother unless you have the community leaders you can't do this as an advocacy group. You've got to go to your town manager. You've got to get your first selectman or your mayor involved. The leadership and the support for this comes from the leadership of the town. And if you don't have the support of the leadership of the town, um, you know, one of the towns that I tried to help was Newtown, Connecticut, after the Sandy Hook shooting about, oh, 2014. And, and the park and rec director, she, she was like all for this with the bicycle groups down there were all for it. The police department was not the police department was, believe it or not, was, was the one that said, no, we're not doing this. So, so just to learn from my experience, uh, when Simsbury got the application, uh, and we got the uh, bronze level, I think with 2009 was the year we got bronze level 
And then the town of South Windsor called Mary Glassman and um, said, hey, can you guys come over here and show us how you did this? So kind of, this was before Zoom meetings were even invented. <laughs> so, so we we went over like literally within a month or two after we received the, the you know, the bronze level, uh, we went over to South Windsor and they had the whole, they had everybody in the room, the town manager, all of the selectmen, school department, police, everybody was involved. It really, as I've heard from many communities, this is like the best thing the town has ever done because, and I didn't realize this, that most municipal governments don't even talk to the Board of Education. <laughs> in Simsbury, it's in the same building. They, they don't really have anything to do with each other. <laughs> so this, as a community building uh, project, even for your own town, even for your government, this actually, um, I've had mayors and first selectmen say, no, no other project has brought us together. And, and it's probably true with the sustainable CT, um, with, with that application also, when you, when you have all these elements and all these people needed to do something, to be a team, it, it actually is really good. So, um, so yeah, so that's my only thing is just, just make sure you, you've got the leadership. Um, I'm, I'm an advocate. I'm, uh, you know, you don't, don't, don't think bad of me, but I'm a car dealer, <laughs> but we are the only gold level bicycle friendly business car dealer in the country. <laughs> so, so I'm multimodal. Uh, I've ridden a bicycle across country. I've ridden from Canada to Key West on the East coast greenway, but I've also been hit from behind by a car and I went backwards through the windshield. So, um, so I, I, I know all aspects of riding a bicycle, um, but yeah, it's, it's really getting your community, getting people connected. Um, and the one thing that's really awesome about League of American Bicyclists is everything is on their website. Um, it's, it's, everything's available on the website. In the towns, people from other towns, West Hartford, Naugatuck, Thomaston, wherever you're from on the Zoom call, the people in the other towns uh, that are bicycle friendly communities, be it Farmington, be it New Britain, West Hartford, Simsbury, Avon, we're, Avon just put in the application, we're hoping to get it. Um, but anyway, so we're all here to help each other. So it, it really is kind of a, a really kind of a, an interesting click. Uh, you know, obviously New Haven and Hartford are different problems, different issues than Simsbury or Canton. Um, but we're all here to kind of help each other. So I think that you'll find that if you reach out to any else league cycling instructor, or if you reach reach out to Bike Walk Connecticut, um, we're here to help you. Thanks for saying that. Yeah. Yeah, there uh, a lot of times too. If you do have um, a difficult, you know, organization that you're working with, um, sometimes I'm just like invite them on a bike ride, you know. Um, or just try to start having uh, regular meetings and inviting them and sharing personal stories from people who are out there biking. Um, it can be a small way, but an effective way to get people to maybe, like they don't have to care about the topic, but maybe they begin to realize that people are doing it and they um, might need to like build the infrastructure for them or do whatever it is for that community to help with that aspect of it. Yep. I was wondering if I could ask a question. Yep. I'm not very familiar with the bicycle part of sustainable CT. So I was wondering how much the certification from League of American Bicyclists overlaps with some of the certification uh, parts of sustainable CT. And also, um, I have a couple of questions. <laughs> uh, what kind of roadblocks have you run into? Like you were talking about the police department not necessarily being for it. And I'd love to know if you had any idea why or if you heard other concerns put forth about why someone might be reticent to support the program. And then also we have a main street that is sandwiched between two state roads. And I think that would be really interesting to understand how to uh, coordinate with the state possibly to consider bicycle friendly. Thank you. 
Yeah, so I can take like two of those questions, I think. <laughs> I can take the other. <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you. Yeah, so for the 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 road, your last question about like the local road, is it locally owned? Um the road that's in between the two state roads? Yeah. Yeah, so I would I would suggest that like um Ha setting up a meeting with your state DOT and whoever is in charge of that locally owned road um, and sit them down to discuss, you know, like the possibilities. Um, there's, there's a lot of avenues to strategize about that kind of issue. I mean, ultimately you could just do whatever you wanted at the local level since the state doesn't have jurisdiction over that road. Um, you can apply for funding and um, see like how much is allocated at the state level to local municipalities and try to advocate for whatever you want to do with that local road. Um, or I'm not, I honestly don't remember what um, state level policies you have. Like if you have a state wide uh, complete street policy or something like that. But if you do, you could advocate to have that incorporated with any um, updates or resurfacing of a road or redistribution of like lanes and things like that, like whenever something comes up. Um, but having an initial meeting just so you can put faces to names and like talk about the issues and hear what, you know, hear what plans are is usually like the best place to start. Um, the other question, now I'm forgetting what it is. A main, was it a main? No, that was the main. What was the other question? <laughs> I think she was asking about roadblocks. Oh, right. Yeah. So um, they honestly like roadblocks come in all shapes and sizes from any corner. Like there's even roadblocks from people who bike, you know, so it's just kind of like figuring out um, what the roadblock is for whatever group of people you're talking to or person. And um, I think like either so, like and figuring out what what is is needed so like sometimes it can just be as simple as like they just want to complain and they just want someone who can listen to them and so if you can be that for them other times it is offering a solution and if you don't have a solution uh you could send them to us and we can offer help i think like having um consistent meetings where there are opportunities for people to come together and to discuss these issues is pretty much like the basic level of trying to start a conversation and talking about these things. Um, but bike rides are usually good, community events, um, recording personal stories and sharing it, uh, writing op-eds to the local newspaper. So just like the voice of biking and walking becomes more mainstream in your community and people don't see it as um, some like marginalized group of people that are out there biking, but it's a pretty like normal thing that's discussed all the time. So Kim, Kim, is she there? What town are I'm here? What, <laughs> I am here. Yeah. What town are you from, Kim? Southbury, Connecticut. Obviously. Okay. So not too far from Newtown. Yeah. Um, so my comment to what Anna was just saying, and she doesn't, you know, uh, you're not from Connecticut, Anna. So but Connecticut, and I don't know if it's like this in other states, but the real simple answer to your question is your police chief in every town of of Connecticut in every town, the police chief is the li liaison to the Department of Transportation. So if you've got some issues and you're trying to do some things within your town, uh, your police chief is the person to start with. He's the direct link. He or she is the direct link to the DOT. Um, so, and DOT, uh, Everybody on this call should write down the name Anna Bergeron. Anna Bergeron is the DOT coordinator for the Department of Trans for Department of Transportation. Uh, there, she's the bicycle pedestrian coordinator for the state. Anna Bergeron, and then um, and I, I forget her name. I think I just got it uh, like two weeks two weeks ago. Uh, good news on the good news side. State of Connecticut has just hired a new. SRTS coordinator, safe routes to school coordinator, and that she works under with Anna Bergeron at DOT. So, so there's actually good things happening in Connecticut. Um, 
and we need everyone on this everyone on the Zoom call to 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 chime in and 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 help make us help get us in the top ten. <laughs> so, thank you. And Kim, to answer your final question about how this fits within the sustainable CT action framework, this is an action. So it's action 6.1.5. If your community attains the bronze designation, it's 10 points. Um, so you can use that in Southbury for your recertification, uh, though you are just certified. So congratulations on that. But it also counts towards the optional uh, climate leader designation as well. So if your community wants to pursue the climate leader designation on top of your bronze, this can help you get there. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? May I ask one more, Anna? Yeah, of course. Um, so this is just about the federal funding that's that's out there. Do you have any specifics on types of funding that might be available to towns? Yeah, so it kind of, right now is like an extremely um, unique time because of the funding that's available. Um, I would suggest every community look into your transportation alternative funding, uh, which is out there. And I I am not, I will, I'll preface this with saying like, I'm not an expert in federal funding. So you should take this all lightly and do your own research or reach out to our people who do the federal funding, which is either Ken or Karen at the league. Um, but I believe transportation alternative federal funding, every state gets an allotment. And so it, um, you can look up to see how much money you get at your state level, and it has to be used on biking and wa walking projects. There's also the um, Safe Streets for All funding, which just got released, who got awarded, so you can see if your community um, got any of that funding, and you can get involved with like how those projects are going to roll out. Um, there's also raise grants, um, which... Um, help with like project implementation. And I believe with a raise grant, if you apply for it and you don't get it, you at least get technical assistance help and funding for that, which can be a huge uh, lift. Um, and maybe I will let Jill talk because uh, they just said that they can weigh in on this. So I'll let you talk. Yes. Um, it's, setting the table so each region i'm in the northeast corner each region ha has a council of governments uh, we have NECOG, new london county had seacock and a lot of the federal infrastructure projects are linked to this it's called the seds report c-e-d-s and usually the cogs the northeast um, uh, council of governments they have a strategic plan. It's a, a comprehensive economic development strategic plan. And whenever you apply for federal funding, they will ask, how is this identified in your SEDS report? So it would be really advantageous to get in front of these reports and put those in as um, complete streets, infrastructure, bike paths, green greenways, that kind of thing. So um, making sure it's listed, even if it's loosely listed, you can refer to it in the federal grant applications, if that makes sense. It has any. It has everything to do with anything to do with um, infrastructure and federal funding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's also um, the Safe Routes for uh, Safe Routes to School program, which has pretty much a contact in every single state, which can also help with um, like literal routes to schools. So, like they help with funding infrastructure or programs around schools and getting kids safely to schools. Um, and there's, there's really, there's so much funding out there, but um, knowing which one might be best for your community is something to figure out too. So I would just, I would check it out, um, that link that I just shared. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Anna. Uh, and we are at time. So maybe if there's one more question from the group or else we'll let you all go off to lunch. So I've got one comment to Kim okay. McNeil from Southbury. I got yes. a gold. I got a gold nugget for you. Okay. You probably don't know who Shan Riggs is. Do yeah. you? Okay. <laughs> Shan Riggs and his girlfriend, who she goes Joswena or she goes by Josh. They started in 
Key West last April and Shan was, is an ultra marathon runner and he ran from Key West and his girlfriend, Josh, she rode a bicycle. She was the support vehicle, a bicycle with a, with a trailer. And the two of them went from Key West to Canada last year. And he set the, what now is the record. I don't know if anybody's gonna challenge it. He ran from Key West to Canada in 78 days. And guess where he lives? He lives in a little town called Southbury, Connecticut. Get out of town. <laughs> that's pretty that's in a town pretty cool, uh, <laughs> yeah. that's a pretty cool fact so here here's kind of a fun thing to end this meeting on though so they started out in key west you know then they they met each other during covid and they're both like in their 40s and so but the you know boyfriend the girlfriend she's got the bicycle with the bike trailer she's got the computer because she, she was she's a chemist and she works you know she does it chemical engineering or something like that. so she was working remotely during while her boyfriend was running well they ran you know did the whole route I ran with them part of the way through Simsbury and when he got the main they they're down the down east sunrise trail and he literally gets they the both of them get about 300 feet from the Canadian border and Shan goes down on his knee and he proposes to his girlfriend and they just had a beautiful wedding back in October so the two of them got married so pretty cool story. So that's kind of an amazing story. Thank yeah. you so much for sharing it. So, so I, in the, in February, the month of love, share the love. I'm a Subaru dealer. So we got to share the love, right? So <laughs> it, 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 it's all, it's all good, but thank you so much for hosting this today. Yep. Yes. Thank you, Anna. And thanks for everyone for joining us. Um, so we will share out the presentation, the recording, and we'll try to pull some of the links that have been popped in the chat for everyone today, but Feel free to grab those right now if you can, but we'll try to pull them out as well. Um, but huge thanks to Anna Tang. This has been really informative and interesting, and, and hopefully we'll get a couple more bike-friendly communities uh, out of this. Yeah. Jess, if just real quick, if what is a, a good email for you or a phone number for you, Jess? Oh, my email, it's Jessica L at sustainablect.org. Okay. And uh, yeah, I'll ask you for the link to this because I know Southington and I know Plainville and Bloomfield. I, I wanted to get it out there and I just didn't have time to get it out there about this meeting today. So I know that they want to become uh, sustainable CT communities and bike friendly communities. So, uh, awesome. so good. Good stuff. Great. Well, thanks okay. everyone and have a great rest of your day. Good. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.